Hey, hello. Um, welcome back to my channel. How have you been? I feel like it's been a while since I've just like sat down and chatted about books. I I have six books to talk about, which I know like isn't actually a lot for the book reviewing world, but it is for me. It's like, I don't know, I've been reading them in the last like month, two months. I don't really know. I don't really care. I'm not bothered by the numbers. Um, they've all been really good. So, okay. First, I need to talk about this book. Um, this isn't like in order, but I just like, I need to get this one out of the way first because I can't stop thinking about it. Um, it's If an Egyptian Cannot Speak English by Noor Naga. Oh my god. <laughs> I tried talking about this on TikTok, but I couldn't even really articulate what I was trying to say. It was so good. It was probably one of like the best books I've read this year. Um, definitely the most memorable. Uh, and that's because not only is the story unique, but the form itself is so interesting. I think I kind of talked about this um, in the other video I posted with my friend um, when she was visiting, but I was kind of rambling, so I'm going to try not to do that this time. Basically, this story is in, set into three parts, okay? And it's following these two characters um, and their kind of fraught relationship. We have um, the kind of protagonist of the story. She's an Egyptian-American um, young woman. She, after Trump gets elected, she's like, I can't take this, I don't want to be in America, I'm moving back to Egypt, except she's never actually um, lived there before. Um, and she moves to Cairo, and then she meets this um, Egyptian guy there who is, who's living in Cairo, was originally a photographer during the Arab Spring, but now is um, lost and uh doesn't really know what he's doing he's um struggling to make ends meet and has some drug abuse problems um and basically the story follows these two characters um meeting and having a tumultuous violent relationship the relationship is fraught um and it really underscores how um, each of them have certain privileges that the other one doesn't have and how that work that works in in contrast to each other and the tension that forms in their relationship um, and then so you have that story which is already very interesting and then the form itself just takes things to a whole nother level part one is in a question and answer format so there's a question and then the story is written in this answer um that'll be like roughly like a couple pages long and it's in um, switching perspectives. So sometimes it's from her perspective, sometimes it's from his perspective and it takes a while to figure out who's who and what's going on um, because it's not immediately um, identified to the reader like, okay, you're, this person is talking, now this person is talking. So it's, it's kind of messing with you there. And then part two is what I would consider like the traditional global or world literature style, which is, you know, like a, a what you would see a typical narrative plot. Um, but instead there's like, whenever there's like um, a word from a foreign language, it's like italicized or like a term. And then there's a bunch of footnotes that explain the like cultural context that um, the term comes from. And I mean, obviously that is very helpful when you're reading the story and it does kind of like bring you in closer to what's going on, but it also, the form itself, I think is kind of um, making fun of this like excessive use of footnotes as well. And then the third part, the third part, I don't want to spoil it, but it's basically in the form of a screenplay. Um, and it's crazy, like it really, blew me away um, okay for some reason i'm having a really hard time articulating what i want to say but basically i really enjoyed how naga approached the um, egyptian american girl like that the main character um and really fleshed out her flaws and like um 
what it means to be this like diaspora um, kid, right? So she is like this Egyptian American woman um, who's never actually lived in Egypt before, um, but is like sick of the um, racism and oppression that exists in America, right? But but she has so much privilege being um, a like immigrant kid, a diaspora kid, like coming back to um, like her ancestral country, right? And like the story really shows like she really sees herself as this like victim, but in the context of where, like in this new environment that she's in, she's the incredibly privileged one. She's the one with the American passport. She's the one that gets to live in a really nice apartment, gets to do all these um, different things. And she does face a lot of um, discrimination. A huge aspect of this is that she has a shaved head and um, it just like weirds everyone out in Cairo because they, they wouldn't really care if it was like a white girl with a shaved head, but because they know she's Egyptian, it like, really just messes with everyone's like like idea of like who she's supposed to be um and it's not that she doesn't face like gendered difficulties it's just the way she ends up moving in the world is just really different than I think like how she um understands herself and I think this critique is really like important in I think popular narrative that isn't really discussed in the like English speaking or like Western facing ways that we understand like immigrants or children of immigrants or like diaspora kids um and like I'm definitely within that demographic right and I I really appreciated um the stories like the way the story was handled with this character like it was it was a well needed and well deserved critique i would say um yeah and there's just like crazy things that happen at the end of this book um i need to like find more people to talk about this because it kind of like broke my brain <laughs> to be honest i knew i was gonna really just go on and on about this book so i wanted to just get it out of the way now that she's done I can put it away and focus on the other great books I've also been reading. Second Place by Rachel Cusk. Um, we all know that I'm a Cusk stan. Love her. Um, and I knew that this was going to get me, and it did. It's everything you want, basically. This is Cusk's latest work of fiction. Um, definitely written within the pandemic in mind. It's not explicitly stated, but um, I think the influence is there. We are following this woman who lives on a remote home with her husband, and they have something called a second place, which is like a house that they've built on their property um, where they invite various creative souls to come and like kind of do like a residency there, right? This woman is obsessed with this guy's paintings that she saw in Paris like years ago that she really like affected her um and she is obsessed with getting him to come stay at their guest house at the second place just she manages to get him to come um and all sorts of weird things ensue and I think the crux of this story is is what does it mean to exist as a woman so wholly defined by the male gaze that even after your days of youth and beauty have passed you are well into middle age you have adult children you have a satisfying romantic relationship life partner how do you understand yourself without this unrelenting need to be validated, to be seen, to be acknowledged by men, by their societal authority. Um, it's so interesting. Like this main character, she's not, it's not a, um, 
this like sexual desire that she's looking for with this man it's about this need to be like at like this she needs him to like her to acknowledge her to see her as a human uh, otherwise she doesn't feel whole um, and the story itself is already so, the setting is so remote, they're in a very remote area, it's just her, her husband, her daughter, and her weird boyfriend come visit, and she, like, she, this man, and the woman that he brings with, with, with him, like, is this, like, outside, um, authority that she, desperately needs it's just so interesting to be in her head like the main character's head as she's like negotiating this de like this desire um yeah i just i think this the subject itself um was unique and um i think this book she like i i can't really think of cusk not being influenced by i love dick like so I, I have i haven't read it but um i read a few like reviews of second place that were putting um second place like in contrast with i love dick and i really want to read it now um i feel like it's very foundational but yeah i mean it's like it's almost insufferable it's like you don't really want the level of honesty that Cusk brings into the main character's like thoughts and obsessions um, and the things that she does to like get what she needs. Um, but like, I think it's honest. I think it's, it's true. Um, it was very well done. I mean, what else did we expect from our queen? And I also finished The Possessed by Elif Batman, which I've been reading since like August. I felt like classic Batuman's like quirky humorous tales um, and it just made me want to keep reading. Um, she, I've said this before, she uses the um, her time at grad school, her understanding of Russian literature as kind of the outline for her to put in her musings about life and her travels um there's okay the last essay is the best everyone needs to read it it's called the possessed um and she's talking about how in the russian book called the possessed there's like this guy that is like demonic and like makes everyone and he's like so charismatic and like larger than life beautiful where he just kind of like makes people sick with their infatuation with him and they like just kind of start going crazy um and they all end up like killing themselves or like dying or it, it like explodes the whole thing and she parallels that with this guy that um enters their like grad school cohort at stanford and he has like the exact same effect and everyone just goes crazy because they like are obsessed with him and he's so like enigmatic and mysterious um and i just feel like when i read that i was like i know exactly the type of person she's talking about like i've known people like that um who are just like soul suckers it was really good um you should read it that's that other book i read was autumn by ali smith i couldn't find it even though i fully own it i don't know where it is um this is the first of the seasonal quartet that she is known for um and i did this as like a buddy read um with my friend emma and i don't know i think it was good it was good overall um but it could have been better but i think there's something about her writing that feels a little ungrounded for me um that basically the story follows this um woman and this older man who um were neighbors when the woman was a young girl and they had a super sweet um lovely friend like unlikely friendship uh, where they would go on walks and he introduced her to the world of literature and art and culture and um had a big impact on her he is i forget the word for it but he's a person who has 
been alive for a hundred years and this is all happening in the present time um during like that the summer of brexit and in particular i think the the aspect of the story that really compelled me and was the reason why i finished it is um the woman rediscovers a forgotten um female british pop artist called pauline boti i think um and this is a real person in real life um but in the story it the pauline Bodhi was like a someone that the um the older man knew um when he was younger and he describes her like the, her pop collage art to the woman as a young girl um and they have this really strong impact on her and then much later in her life when she's like an adjunct professor or no before she just ends up basically refinding her art and does her like thesis on it. it was just so cool seeing like just kind of like learning about that artist i read paradise by Fernanda melcour just like everybody else <laughs> really has been like the darling of booktube and I mean, for good reason. It is a really, really unique, um, a really unique story. Another one that I don't think I will forget for a very long time. But one thing I have to say is it's like a hundred pages, but it feels so long because the writing style, as you probably know, is just unrelenting blocks of text with no break. Um, and the content is super violent and hard to read and disgusting and it really gives you this feeling of just no mercy. Um, it, it has a really, it has the type of effect that I think a lot of books want to do but many fail to do so. It, it really is forcing you as a, to the reader like I know this is uncomfortable, it sucks, but you like you need to read this. Like there's something about it where you just like want it to get out of your system. You're like, I need to just sit and finish this as soon as possible so I can like be relieved of Fernanda Malcor's like chokehold on you. Um, it's just I it's like hard to talk about, to be honest. Um I think also people talk about this book and I don't think People make it completely clear that this this book really does center around the plotting and enactment enactment of a really brutal rape so if you don't want to read that totally acceptable don't do it um but yeah like that's fully what this book is about um what made this like i think really interesting for me was the um the spoiled brat kid is the one that want like very actively wants to rape this woman, right? And then we have the gardener boy, and he's the he's the one that we're getting most of the um, story from, like from his perspective. And he thinks that the spoiled brat kid is just like kind of crazy, doesn't believe him, disregards him, is kind of just using him to um, smoke and drink with, right? Because he has the money. But, so the spoiled brat kid always kind of sucks, right, throughout this story. But what's interesting about the gardener kid is you only, by like learning more about his past um, and what's happened to him in his, in his brief life and um, his relationship to his mother, his cousin, his relationship to the men around him, and to society at large, do you begin to understand his deeply rooted misogyny as well? Um, and he's also ha also really does hate women. Um, it's just in a slightly different way than um, the more like obvious outward facing way misogyny of um, the spoiled brat. That the way you kind of uncover that and why these two boys. Are drawn to each other is so is like I think what makes the story um, really special so yeah that's what I have to say about this you know I don't like recommend it but you should also read it you know and then I just finished Paradise Rot um, in a couple of days I read this super quickly by Jenny Hall I love Dick quote on the back this was in my fall 
vibe rec books. Um, and I just did a little review of this on Instagram. This was pretty much what it what I was expecting. Um, like a solid, I would say 4.5 out of 5. It is fall, it's a very like dank, musty, moldy story. Um, it's very, very narrow. As you read the story, it gets smaller and smaller in scope. And the descriptions are very, very, um, what's that word, like minute, like the character can like feel these apples like rotting on the table or like can like hear the the like really small sound of like fabric um, of a clothes like rustling against bed sheets like tiny things um that really kind of like wrap you into the story and make you feel like you are in this moldy what is it pet petri dish you know what i mean like that feeling <laughs> not that that's like a common feeling um but it's it what i'm trying to say is it's very atmospheric it's following this norwegian exchange student i think she goes to this like random town in england it's super cold and small and sleepy um she finds this open spot in this like loft style converted warehouse apartment thing with this other um girl named carol the walls are super thin like they're like those fake plaster walls that landlords do um and so you can like hear everything um it has like high ceilings it's like this weird space where there's like no privacy um like built into the the house but also the roommate herself just like has no boundaries like and the, the main character is like attracted to her roommate like she has this desire for her but doesn't really know um what to make of it what to place it she is it's, it's very much of a coming age coming of age story house itself literally starts to grow mold and like mushrooms come out and like all this types you know the atmosphere is getting more and more intense and then there's kind of like a reckoning at the end i thought it was good i think there were some sentences that were just a little cringe honestly that kind of took me out of it like when the rest of the writing was so good, where it felt very like, why is this in here? Um, but I think overall it was good. Let me know if you want to read any of these after I've talked your head off about them. Um, yeah, I'm reading Real Life by Brandon Taylor right now, and I'm going to read In the Dream House next. So that's, that's the current state of affairs. Um, I hope you're doing well. And... Yeah, that's it.